Hi everyone. Well, today I'm going to talk about the unexpected closure of I-195 on the east side of Providence, Rhode Island. This closure occurred on Monday, December 11th in the afternoon. I'm going to go over the key aspects of this closure and then talk about a lot of inconsistencies relative to the statements made by Rhode Island DOT, in particular their director, and uh, what it means for these types of situations or f these types of situations that may occur on other bridges in the future. So the portion of the bridge that was closed was the westbound lanes. You can see in this photo where the ramp curves off to the north, that's the westbound side of the bridge. And as I mentioned, this uh, bridge is located in Providence, Rhode Island. This is a major thoroughfare with daily bridge crossings in excess of 90,000 vehicles per day. You can see from this Google Earth view that this bridge for I-195 crosses the Seekonk River. This bridge was built in 1968, and like a lot of bridges in the United States that were built primarily in the late 60s, but really throughout the 50s and 70s, with the high point being really between 1966 and 1969, this bridge falls right in there, having been opened in 1968. Now let's start out by the statements uh, by Rhode Island DOT Director Peter Altivi about why this bridge was closed. Uh, the critical finding was the failure of, a, of several critical um, structural components on that bridge. The failure is such that uh, it could potentially be the cause of a catastrophic failure. Now, this is the culprit cited for the reason for this sudden bridge closure. You have these anchor rods that connect sections of the cantilevered spans. And in this case, this was at span number seven, which you can see from this photo is in the middle of the river. Now to say the sudden closure of these two bridge lanes on the westbound side is a major disruption is a vast understatement. So it's gonna take a few weeks to get some temporary routing for some westbound traffic, but the overall repair work to restore the westbound lanes is expected to take in excess of three months. And I think they got their work cut out for them trying to do these kind of repairs in the middle of the winter. Now I'm just gonna play various segments of these press conferences held by the director of Rhode Island DOT and I wanna have you keep some key parts in mind as I go back through my reactions to these statements made by Rhode Island DOT. So the big picture is listen to what he says about why they closed the bridge, why they think they uh, had to close the bridge, and, and, that, and that means what caused the apparent damage to these anchor bolts, and what their overall view about how this could have occurred uh, is is seen in their mind. Number one objective here is to keep things safe for all of you. And uh, we have done that so far. We intend on continuing to do that. Is that the last inspection on this bridge happened in July. It was in good condition. The young engineer that we have working on the bridge adjacent to this structure uh, noticed during the reconstruction of the new bridge that we're building um, notice the failure of one of the pins, that our anchor pins that hold uh, major uh, beams in place, that um, as old bridges like this go, if one pin uh, becomes deficient, then it can have a compounding effect on the other pins in the bridge, and that's what happened in this case. As to when it, if there were no failures at the locations that the failures took place, or over the weekend, they did an intense investigation of all of the other components of this bridge, and they found other deficiencies that were happening in a kind of a cascading way. That the prudent thing to do, the safe thing to do, close the bridge to traffic in order to keep the safety of the 90,000 people a day that travel over that bridge. Now, one of the key statements made here by the director of the DOT is that this bridge was in good condition, as noted in the last full inspection, which was in July of 2023. And I've got that inspection report, I've read through it. It's posted online at their website. And uh, I can tell you that not, not only the photos, but the actual reports posted, and categorically, the condition of this bridge is noted as poor, which means structurally deficient. And in particular, the bridge superstructure was noted as being structurally deficient or poor condition rating. So in the sequence of events, apparently the July inspection didn't uncover anything particularly alarming, although 
I'll go through some of the key photos. You can see why this bridge was deemed to be in poor structural condition. Rhode Island DOT has been in the process of replacing this bridge. They've been working on the eastbound lanes first and reportedly a junior engineer on Friday morning, December 8th, while working on the adjacent eastbound lanes, happened to look over on the westbound lanes and see something odd with essentially the, the deck of the bridge bouncing up and down under traffic in, in an abnormal fashion, not the little bit of flexures that you might expect, but excess movement, which got him looking further into it and he noticed breakage of at least one, possibly two, according to reports, anchor bolts in this bridge. And again, these anchor bolts support significant loads for the bridge deck. So you can, you know, you heard from the statements from the Rhode Island DOT director, they closed this bridge because of concerns of potential for a catastrophic failure. So my question is, even if a junior engineer notes that, hey, this anchor rod's broken and communicates that to other people on staff, why does it take over three days to actually close the bridge? Rhode Island DOT announced the bridge closure again Monday afternoon, and after the announcement, it was closed within an hour, causing major traffic disruptions in the area. And then on the next day, Tuesday, in-person class was canceled for the school children in this area, just because the commute times were just unbelievably long. So one of the early statements made by the director of the Rhode Island DOT is that some extraordinary event occurred that caused this failure of the anchor bolts or the anchor rods in the bridge deck. And the speculation was it was a heavily loaded truck that went over the bridge, essentially illegally in excess of rated load conditions and caused this damage. Once in a while, an extraordinary event will happen as we, as we, as our engineers are telling us happened in this case. Some kind of outside force that was extraordinary over and above the normal use of everyday use of the bridge happened between July and now. That's the best information that they have that they're giving to me that I'm passing to you right now. I was uh, contacted by a friend of the channel. I, I don't know that he wants to be named at this point. And he made uh, several excellent points about this whole episode. And one of them was, hey, there's way stations, video cameras, there's lots of surveillance uh, in and around this bridge. So to have this essentially phantom vehicle uh, that's alleged to be responsible for this damage, I'm kind of skeptical about. To me, the, the more obvious question would be, was this missed in previous inspections and particularly in the most recent July 2023 inspection? So in response to that question, Rhode Island DOT issued some comparison photos of the July 2023 photos of this anchor bolt location and the December 8th photos when the breakage was first noted. Now, the odd thing about this comparison photo is that they're taken at different angles. And the so-called pre-damage photo, if, if you want to believe that or subscribe to that, you actually can't see the portion of the anchor rod that is now broken. So to me, it's, it's a very fair question as to, you know, was this simply missed? Now, you saw from that press conference that the governor of Rhode Island definitely looked like he'd rather be somewhere else. Uh, he was elected in 2022. He was appointed earlier than that. So he's got quite a bit of time left on his term. But uh, the political fallout associated with this closure isn't, isn't over yet. Uh, there's going to be a lot of questions, a lot of anger. It's not a good time to be a politician in this part of the country, given what's happened here. And the director of the DOT also throws out this notion that Hey, extraordinary things happen like the I-95 fire in Philadelphia this past summer. And uh, I, there, again, there's no evidence that this bridge suffered from an extraordinary circumstance. First, let's go through a few sections of this December 8th inspection report. Again, there's the notation about excessive movements of the bridge deck under traffic. They show the photos of various bridge damage, particularly with the anchor bolt. A lot of corrosion separation. This is not something you want to see on a major bridge. You can see the anchor bolt's broken. He's got a ruler through the top of it. This is that picture they used for comparison to the 2023 inspection report. I mean, there's whole sections that have been removed. Exposed rebar, spalling of concrete, which typically happens when there's underlying corrosion of the reinforcing steel. 
see evidence of corrosion, iron oxide staining, a lot of corrosion of structural steel. So to me, if I were to advance a leading theory as to what happened here, you can see that there's extensive corrosion throughout this bridge. So if you've got a corroded anchor bolt that's been corroding for many, many years, it's not unreasonable to think that at some point it's gonna break under normal traffic loading. And if you don't produce evidence that the exact spot of the anchor bolt that broke was documented, the condition was documented in previous inspections, you really have no basis for making the statement that it broke because of a rogue heavily loaded truck. And again, if the concern was for the potential of catastrophic failure of this bridge due to the observation of the broken anchor rod, which I think is a reasonable concern, why did it take him over three days to close the bridge? Now, the reason given by the director of the DOT in the press conference was they needed to look at more parts of the bridge to uh, be confident in their decision making. And all they did was just find other areas of damage, not as alarming as a sheared anchor bolt, alarming nonetheless. And uh, according to the director of the DOT, he indicated that the type of damage observed from December 8th and the subsequent few days was, indi in, was indicative of a cascading type failure. So something breaks, which causes other things to break, which causes even more things to break subsequently. I'll run a few segments here of interviews with local commuters that are not at all happy with this situation. And now take a look at this. We already saw traffic turn into a parking lot tonight. This is where people are being diverted off of 195 West. Drivers reporting to us that they were at a standstill, as you can see. And it's not likely to get any better for the thousands of commuters who use this bridge every day. You mean to tell me I can't get over this tomorrow morning? Frustration's high. Complete chaos. They've been doing this for years, and this is all they've managed to accomplish. I mean, the impacts to the people in the area, I don't think could be overstated. You've got people that are going to have long, long commute times. You have certain businesses. Uh, I didn't show it in the clip, but there's a pizza delivery company. How can you deliver a pizza if it takes you eight hours round trip to do it? I mean, it's just not viable. And the state officials recognize this. They're trying to open up lines of credit and relief loans with the Small Business Administration for these impacted business owners. And another thing I'll mention is that uh, Peter Alviti, the director of Rhode Island DOT, according to his LinkedIn profile, he's an engineer by education. So for him to make statements that really aren't supported by the documentation, I think is a, could be a problem here. Of course, he's clearly trying to provide political cover for the governor in this state, which is perhaps understandable from an administrative standpoint, but from an engineering and public relations standpoint, I think you have to be fully transparent and clearly state what you know and what you don't know. Now, as I mentioned, a lot of this interstate highway system that we're the beneficiaries of today was built by our parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents, and uh, we've been using them ever since. It's an integral part of our society, the ability to move from one city to another, to, to commute from the suburbs. Just, it's, it's ingrained into our way of life. And when you suddenly close a bridge, it simply has major impacts on people. Now, you can see from this map of the interstate highway system, most of the interstate infrastructure is in the northeastern eastern part of the United States, which you would expect given the population density being higher in those locations. The interstate highway system includes over 48,000 miles of roadway and over 54,000 bridges. And here's that stat where 25% of this 54,000 bridges was built between 1965 and 1969. This stat shows that 42% of all bridges are at least 50 years old, and keep in mind the design life for most of these bridges is in the 50 to 60 year range. A lot of bridges are in operation much longer than that depending on how effective the maintenance has been. But again, these bridges were designed to be replaced after 50 or 60 years. And of this total, seven and a half percent of the nation's bridges are considered to be structurally deficient. That is poor condition. Now, before I get to this next slide, leave a comment as to what percentage of bridges in Rhode Island are considered to be structurally deficient or in poor condition. Well, it's the highest percentage in the country at 22%. The lowest percentage of structurally deficient bridges is in the state of Nevada. Now, there are regional differences for why that could be the case. Obviously, they don't salt their roads in Arizona. I'm sure they salt the roads in Rhode Island. A lot of this corrosion that I'm seeing, I see throughout the Midwest where the roads are heavily salted in the winter and it really accelerates the deterioration of the condition of these bridges. 
So the statistics that I just cited came from the infrastructure report card at uh, www.infrastructurereportcard.org if you want to check it out for yourself. So I'll continue to follow this story. I appreciate those of you who have reached out to me and I also appreciate uh, we've got one channel member at this point. It's just a single tier. So if you'd like to support the channel in this way, I'm going to continue to have breaking news stories as, along with my own unique take, I think, on what the implications are for this, these types of stories. You know, I think the, new, the news media is in general poorly equipped to handle engineering related stories. You know, I look at some of the questions and follow-up questions posed by reporters and you know they're, they're kind of missing some of the, the key questions in my mind and essentially are presented with the opportunity to take at face value some of these assertions made by the public officials there and the transportation officials in Rhode Island. So thanks for watching everyone. Please leave a comment, hit that subscribe button, and stay tuned for future videos.